to our first podcast, and it is a unique podcast about the authentic Las Vegas, Nevada, the phenomena of Las Vegas, Nevada. I was born and raised here, and I have seen a lot of evolution. And speaking of evolution, the name of our show is Las Vegas Hospitality Evolution. And we will have individuals on this show that will tell you things that you would never know about this unique city. Along with myself is my co-host, we are co-host, Dr. Thomas Peacock, a very renowned uh, industry expert, uh, also a professor, taught in Singapore for UNLV, has taught at CSN. He is a real knowledgeable individual operationally because he opened up the Mandalay Bay as a senior vice, as a vice president of HR. He opened up uh, the Luxor as a vice president of HR. He has literally hired in these mega resorts hundreds and thousands uh, of people you know, it, throughout his career. He was also a general manager, a general manager for the Hacienda Hotel. He's going to get into his background, um, and you will know uh, when he's finished that, indeed, he knows a lot about the evolution of Las Vegas. Dr. Thomas Peacock, you are... Oh, uh, here not we only, go. Only my <laughs> my 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 uh, co-host, but we are we are dear friends. Um, yes, we are. And yes, we and are. Um, I remember when I was uh, teaching at the college, and I um, was hired in surveillance at your at the Luxor. Beautiful Hotel. Luxor, yes. That's where we met, and um, we met under kind of strange circumstances. I. Uh, but we won't go into that right now. It was good circumstances. Uh, that's when I knew that you were indeed a special it, individual. It turned out to be a good circumstance. It turned out to be it, a great. It, it didn't begin that way. No. Uh, but uh, as the as we worked out appropriately, it turned out good. And we uh, and, and, and again, I want to talk about you. Yeah. And we'll we'll talk. We'll let our audience when they follow us, they will hear that story at, at in another episode. Yes. But today, I want you to tell me, how did you come to Las Vegas? Some of the things that you have done here, I know that you're an academic. I know that you're operational. You are um, an industry expert. Um, and that's why UNLV hired you over at Singapore, uh, CSN. We are so lucky that, that you will teach some courses for us, especially in HR. I well. mean, <laughs> how, can you, how can you get... Uh, a, a, a better HR instructor besides a guy that, that has opened up uh, one of the two of the 17 largest hotels in the world, uh, the Mandalay Bay and the Luxor. Dr. Peacock. Well, th thank you, uh, Dr. Wright, for that uh, fine introduction. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, uh, it is an honor to be part of the podcast that you thought about, created, dreamt about, and here we are today across from each other doing just that. And it's an honor because you are, my good friend, uh, not only recognized by your peers in the academic world, but by the industry leaders in this beautiful city of Las Vegas. Who else could have brought Elaine Wynn? Who else could have brought Sig Rogich? Who else could have bought, brought these great individuals, iconic individuals, into the classroom for our students. Uh, and so for me uh, to have participated that and watched you coordinate and uh, make these productions uh, was incredible. You're an academic first. I actually use your textbook in the classes that I teach, uh, the introduction uh, to hospitality. And uh, when I use talk about HR, I talk about you, and I talk about my students who have had you for their professors, yes. and they all ultimately respect you. So it's a mutual respect and admiration here, but as you said, our goal 
is to introduce to our community, the students, the leaders in this industry, and managers and supervisors, not only in Las Vegas, uh, Professor Wright, but domestically, around this country, people who are interested in hospitality need to know where it was, in my opinion, born, right here in Las Vegas. And now it is global. Don't you think for one second that Resource World Las Vegas had just opened did not have their eye on us. In Singapore, Marina Bay Sands with Sheldon Adelson had their eye on what's happening in Las Vegas. That's what it is all about and what we're going to introduce through a number of interviews uh, of people who are at the highest levels and also the people who were in the working areas. Uh, and, and this could not have happened without visionaries like a Steve Wynn, a Sheldon Adelson, a Bill Bennett, Certainly a Kirk Kikorian uh, and Howard William Hughes. Boyd. Uh, William Boyd, thank you. Yes. I mean, these are the builders. I mean, these, uh, these are the men and women uh, with Elaine Wynn and other women. Now, uh, we now know that Cindy Kaiser Murphy, I think, is now going to be leading the, the Palms. Uh, so there's a lot to talk about and cover over many of our episodes. So, uh, But to get to be to where Tom came from, how did he land here? You were born and raised here. I started out in Southern California in my adult career as a firefighter, if you can believe that, uh, and rose to the rank of captain and then left that department and became a deputy fire chief in, in another location. Uh, but then uh, uh, I ended up in Reno, Nevada, working for Del Webb uh, in the, at the Sahara Reno, which was under construction. So that was my first opening experience, was opening a 600-room Del Webb property, and it was fun. Del Webb at that time was the largest employer in the state in gaming. I don't need to tell you, they had the Sahara Reno, Sahara Tahoe, the Park Tahoe, which is now Caesars, which a lot of young men in our industry started out, Terry Lanny, Mike Mecca, there's a number of people that started there. Uh, and then from, from uh, uh, Reno, uh, I was assigned to uh, be uh, the head of uh, human resources for the Sahara Las Vegas, which was some interesting times. Uh, we had some serious union activity. Uh, one of the first times they were trying to organize the dealers at our property, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, we went through some strikes. But uh, it, it was a good, good introduction to, uh, to Las Vegas, at the, at the Sahara Las Vegas. Uh, from the Sahara Las Vegas, uh, I, I went on to uh, uh, the Hacienda Hotel and became uh, the general manager and for two years at that property, which was a beautiful property, by the way. I actually have a photo of it. Uh, I want to show you this uh, photo. This is a photo that takes us back to, had to be about around the 1990s. Uh, can you see that okay, Art? Yes. Okay, and down here is the Hacienda. This was a Warren uh, and Judy Bailey a concept. Uh, Mr. Bailey had uh, Hacienda properties in California, and he built this. And what was really cool about this is this, uh, when unfortunately Mr. Bailey passed, uh, Judy Bailey took over, and this was her suite right here next to the most beautiful pool I'd seen. I, I can tell you that. And, of course, this is the Hacienda. Next to it is the Luxor, which I'll talk about through our little uh, discussions. And, of course, the Excalibur up here at the top. Uh, one thing I will point out, uh, not to divert off this subject, but here is the MGM. And the MGM opened up with a giant lion's mouth that you had to walk through to enter into the property. And of course, that meant that this property wasn't properly uh, feng shui because when you appeal to our Asian uh, customers, which make up 17% of, uh, of our customers approximately, uh, they're not gonna walk through a lion's mouth. But they, so what MGM did was take that down and put a, uh, another lion up, which they replicated actually in, in Macau. But I love the photo because this is 19, approximately 1993, and uh, you can see golf courses 
uh, where great properties have been built, the Bellagio and things of that nature. And, and you, you can imagine, when the Hacienda was built, it was the first property on the Strip that people coming from California would see, would be this beautiful property right here that uh, I had the pleasure of running with a great Dr. Staff. Peacock, I wanted Let's to ask you a question. This pic this is the the old Dunes golf course. Yes, it is. Golf course. It's the old Dunes golf course. And across the street is Caesars Palace. Oh, the great Caesars, great which we're going to talk Palace. about yes. when we get to yes. some of your stuff, uh, for sure. And the Tropicana is across here. But you can see downtown uh, and look at the beautiful surrounding mountains. Uh, look at Las Vegas. That's why, why we're at the center. We, in my opinion, invented this stuff. I have been overseas and watched them evolve. And I watched them, uh, I don't want to use the term replicate, but it's pretty close. You, what you see uh, there now is basically Las Vegas on steroids. I mean, they just did it bigger. Bigger buildings and stuff like that. If you that. were to, 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 to do a uh, compare uh, uh, analysis of the Kotai Strip in Macau <coughs> and our strip here, would they have similar hotels there? Oh, yes. Well, uh, of course, remember, it was Mr. Adelson that conceived this. And uh, I'm not going to mention the name of a very high-profile individual here that he took before they start reclaiming the property between the two islands of Taipa and Cologne, which becomes the Kotai, Kotai Strip. When he said that to a very important person here in Las Vegas, you want to be part of this? And the fella said, no way. This is never going to happen. No faith. Today, it is exactly what you just said. The Venetian that sits on our strip, a Venetian sits, was the first property built on the Kotai, the Kotai Strip, which the only difference is it's bigger. It's huge. Because guess what? Right next to the Kotai Strip is the People's Republic of China with a billion, 400 million people. Think of the market there. It had to be huge and bigger because to accommodate not only your, your day trippers, but the high rollers as well. So it's, a, it's an amazing thing. But let me just do, we'll get back to... When I uh, moved to the, um, uh, the Sahara, Las Vegas, uh, I worked for Del Webb, and Del Webb sold it to Paul Loudon, who owned the Hacienda at that time. And this is w one of the ideas I want to share quickly, and then I'm going to get to you, my good friend, uh, was the Sahara Hotel. And this little photo here shows you the Sahara Hotel and this large tower and uh, this, the highest freestanding Sahara sign is right there. I hope you can see that. When I looked at that, I thought, man, wouldn't it be interesting to have a high wire act from the top of the Sahara sign and go all the way to the uh, top of that tower? And I thought about it. I climbed the top of the, uh, the staircase, the uh, tower, the, sign, the signage, and looked across, and I said, man, this would be perfect. And I knew exactly who the perfect person would be. Felipe Petit, who was the man who strung a high wire across the Twin Towers. Think of the Twin Towers, bless them. Uh, uh, he did that, and so I called Felipe Petit and said, uh, Felipe, would you be interested in doing this uh, here in Las Vegas? And Felipe being the, oh yes, this sounds like a really interesting thing. Uh, Felipe, tell me what it would take to get you here. Then Felipe went through his laundry list or the perk list. What is that term when an entertainer lists all the things that they must have? Whatever that is, he listed first class uh, travel, uh, a salary, of course, a payment, everything, food and beverage. I mean, on and on. The list on. is called a writer. That's exactly what it is. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. Uh, he, he had this list, and so... Uh, when I went to Mr. Loudon and mentioned this to him, uh, uh, his first thought wasn't the cost. His first thought about what would happen if, if he fell. If he fell. Right. Uh, and I, I would, everybody would feel sad about it, but it would be shown around the world uh, in terms of a marketing thing. And I actually called Stan Irwin, who was the manager of Johnny Carson, 
brought the Beatles to the uh, Sahara and is a great agent uh, promoter in his, in, in his own what route. It's a great idea. In fact, I've been talking to Bill Bennett about doing something like that at the Excalibur. So I was pretty excited about that. But at the Did you beat him out the box with uh, Evil Knievel over at Caesars? Did you do this before? No, this was subsequent to that. That was. Uh, but it was all sensational. But it was. And that's what Las Vegas. And that's Vegas. Yeah, that was it. That was my thought of it, precisely. So it was, it was most interesting. Anyway, so I went on from there into the academic world uh, after I left the Luxor, which was an opening, and uh, we probably took in maybe 60,000 applications. There's a formula when you, when you hire that you interview 10 people before you get to the one. It's a metric that uh, uh, Toyota used uh, uh, when they did their hiring staff, and it was one that we pretty much use now. So I, need, I knew how many, I had to get to 60,000 to get to 6,000 employees. When we did the Mandalay Bay, which I transferred to as the VP of HR there, same thing, same concept. Uh, uh, and we'll talk about that. It was, 10, it was a, to get another 10 to 1. I knew we were going to have close to 10,000 employees, counting all the vendors and all the uh, restaurants and everything. Uh, so I needed close to 100,000. We stopped probably around 90,000, that was plenty, and, and I'll get into more details later, maybe on subsequent programs, but that's pretty much Tom, and, uh, and as you said, I taught overseas for UNLV, which to me was one of the great UNLV uh, moves, was to open a campus, and it was there for six years, and uh, unfortunately it was uh, closed, but Singapore is the center uh, of the financial uh, things that are going on in Southeast Asia for sure. So uh, anyway, and then, uh, as I said, I got into the academics and taught at CSN, which I love. And as I said, use your textbook and teach HR and uh, love every minute of it. Uh, so uh, that's what got me here, brother. Well, I tell you, uh, my textbook uh, is the intro to hospitality management through the eyes through the lens of Las Vegas. And so my yes. students, domestically and internationally, they get a history lesson on this phenomenal city called Las Vegas and how it evolved. Hence, uh, you know, we started a lecture series, and now, now that lecture series has evolved or uh, is now our podcast. But on this podcast, we'll show some of the lectures of Elaine Wynn, um, of um, Sig Rogich, some of the names that you named. Mayor Oscar Goodman. Good Mayor yes. Goodman. He was awesome. He, he blew my students uh, uh, away when he brought in a showgirl. Two showgirls, <laughs> I think. Yeah, no, no, no. It was one showgirl. Then a martini. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And then he brought in his martini. Yes. But he's a showman. He, he, he's a lecturer, lecturer. Uh, the kids loved him, and we'll go in another uh, episode. We'll talk about those lectures of Elaine Wynn and and Perfect. also uh, uh, Governor Bob Miller. He he um, had another take on Las Vegas from a political and a personal point of view, uh, as well as Senator Bryan. Richard Bryan was also gave of his time to come out and talk to another bank of talented uh, students uh, that will be a part of this industry or other industries in hospitality. That's exactly what the goal is. Yes. For sure. Uh, and you mentioned, uh, I mentioned the Luxor opening. Uh, my boss at that opening was none other than Mr. Bill Paulus, who you know well and was one of the people that made the presentation. Yes, he his lecture was the last lecture before the uh, pandemic. Yeah, he was my and man, we we got. He was so gracious enough to come because the, they were talking about the pandemic and being in closed areas and stuff. And I kind of mentioned it to him, and he says, "Man, I'm gonna I'm coming out," you know. And he blessed our kids with with a excellent, uh, uh, you know, down to earth. Connect the dots. See the big picture of what it is to be a leader of people um, that we're trying to raise in 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 what we do uh, at the college, and and that is to be an asset 
to to our businesses as as a leader of people and he really laid it out there for not only that the, that individual audience but now we have it on YouTube where I can refer and you can refer mm -hmm. students to go and see a real leader um, talk about anecdotes of what occurred uh, during that time. Not Don't read about it. Talk to the person that made it happen. And uh, indeed, our lecture series is called Let Las Vegas be your classroom. How these, is that? The, uh -huh. <laughs> these are this is Las Vegas, and they are being your classroom. These are the people that contributed, that that operated, that helped evolve uh, the hospitality industry, reinvented the hospitality industry. No one, uh, they 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 can't catch us. They they can't be another Las Vegas. But they borrow so many things. They watch us, as you mentioned, uh, um, that they watch us here. You got the Kotai Strip. You got the Las Vegas Strip. So I'm, I'm very proud of this city because I was born and raised here. Oh. You know, and, and, you know, I happen to be uh, born at Nellis Air Force Base, which is in my father was a boxer. In in the in the uh, he he was oh my goodness I yeah. wish I could have seen that oh Ernest Wright Jr. he was a boxer young guy met my mom and uh, love at first sight yes here, here you go with the baby boomer <laughs> that's how the baby boomers got here you know the, yes of course the, the servicemen and and uh, uh, the civilians uh, getting together after the war um, I I want to share with you. Or uh, unless you 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 wanted to say something else. Well, uh, no, but you you did make uh, you know in in working with uh, what I consider one of the top leaders is a Bill Paulus. I yes. worked with uh, another excellent uh, leader, Tony Alamo. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, you know there was a Tony Ashley. Uh, may he rest in peace. Is gone. Uh, he was uh, my boss at the Sahara Reno, and then came down to run the. Sahara Las Vegas and then the Sahara at that time the Sahara Tahoe which has changed names and, and ownership so I was lucky to be working for these people that took uh, the, this evolution we're talking about a little step each time but the mm -hmm. big ones were the ones we mentioned at the well outset. you you were a part of that evolution as well yes you know and and, and that's why you you're a perfect uh, host for this program and and uh, and indeed it's my honor to to be a co-host with you but you know to come up with that idea of having Felipe to to walk that's <laughs> that what is Las Vegas all about sensationalism man yes sensationalism not sin sensationalism yeah, yeah. you know you what know? <laughs> Felipe Betty if you're listening to this and show and you will because you're on the east coast sometime you missed a great opportunity uh, and uh, we should have went through with that because yes. it would have been an eye opener. Yes, I, I um, again, I was born and raised here in Las Vegas, yes. Nevada. I, I, um, I'm a product of CCSD, uh, Clark County School District. Amen. And um, I went to Western High School. I had uh, more football offers than I did basketball. Like football. Football. Well, I was well, a split look, in. Come on, man. I can put you in football. Yeah. Yeah, I was a split in. And, and, I, and I had some quickness. I ran track. And I was going to be one of those tall split ends back in those days that they had a big target to throw to. Yes. Well, I, I, speaking of that, um, David Hum and I went to uh, Our Lady of Las Vegas. Mention who he is. Uh, David Hum, uh, in, uh, uh, NFL quarterback for the Oakland Raiders. Yes. Uh, he was also, I don't know if David was born in Vegas, but he and I met each other in the third grade at Our Lady of Las Vegas. That is incredible. And what an athlete he, he, he was. Uh, always he, uh, uh, a very handsome guy, but his beauty was, was his personality, man. Uh, of course, you know, he, 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 he's an attractive, he was an attractive individual, but he was always down to earth. When he made it uh, to the pros, he would always call me, and I, man, I feel honored, and, and he'd say, hey, if you're this way, you can get tickets, and, that. and I'm saying, okay. But the real story was that uh, what I wanted to talk about is that David 
went on from uh, from uh, Our Lady of Las Vegas to uh, Gorman, and he wanted me to go to Gorman. Oh, but yes. but he and I were both altar boys. Uh, again, a conspiracy two two old Doremus nominus patis and spiritus and spiritus and spiritus and santos are men male copa milk. We we knew the mass in Latin as little kids, and man, you couldn't mess up. I can imagine. You yes. know, uh, uh, but we were very very good friends. He wanted me to go to to Gorman, but I I my parents gave me an opportunity. Do you want to continue in parochial school, or do you want to go to uh, another school? And and I said I I, I want to I just want to try a public school. So I went to Garside, and people, you may not believe this, I went to Garside Junior High School, and out of my homeroom, the name Garside Gladiators. Yes. Came from me. How did that happen? Now? Please, <laughs> well, are you kidding? You know, Go. Uh, uh, you know, I I spent some time in in Las Curse. Vegas, and the gladiators. The the, the it, it came to me because, unfortunately, there was a gang in Los in Los Angeles called the Gladiators, and I just said Garside Glad. Okay, <laughs> I wasn't thinking about the real gladiators. Exactly. I was thinking about. But anyway, so I went to Garside, and. Um, uh, then I moved back to uh, Los Angeles um, and went to uh, Dor- uh, I went to Audubon Junior High School. No, the first thing I did was my mother um, uh, got me into St. Bridget's, mm-hmm. uh, another parochial school, and and um, uh, you know I, I I got a taste of uh, the school in uh, in Las Vegas Garside, and then I went to the parochial school. And then I, I told my mother, you know, I want, I want to just keep going to public school. And so I went to Angeles Mesa, and then I went to Audubon Junior High School, where a lot of black entertainers sent their kids. I mean, Red Fox. This is I Southern mean, California. That's yeah. in Southern California in the Lamert area, not far from the Crenshaw area. But Lamert was a little more ritzier mm-hmm. uh, than the Crenshaw area. And so I, I went from... Audubon to Dorsey High School, and when okay. Crenshaw was built around the corner from my home uh, on Sixth Avenue and Forty Eighth, I went to Crenshaw, and I stayed there a semester, and I, I came back to Las Vegas and uh, graduated from Western High School. But uh, it, it what a great story! Yeah, like, you know, I'm thinking when you mentioned Crenshaw, I believe I think I, I probably should have mentioned it, but. I think that's where the new SoFi Stadium is located, where the Rams and the Los Angeles Chargers are playing. I want to say that, on Christian, by by the not far from the airport, not far from SC, uh, you know. It, that that may in that, area. that may be, uh, mm. but Crenshaw High I'm School. Um, uh, we were in the Western League, and um, we, you know we played against Fairfax and. I would say this: We were all, all black high school, and and we played in the Western League, which was basically all white. So when I came to Las Vegas from an all black high school, it wasn't a culture shock because I had, you know, going to Art Lady, I was the only black in my class, and and so I I kind of had an advantage uh, um, over a, a, I would say my peers. Uh, from the West Side because uh, a, a lot of my peers didn't understand um, the the white culture as much as I did. My sense. Uh, and I, and I under you know going from from West Las Vegas over to uh, um, uh, to Our Lady of Las Vegas uh, and uh, you would have to drive through uh, uh, now I'm. Uh, the the very it's a ritzy area I can't think of it right now mm-hmm. for for some reason, but anyway so I I I saw that part of Vegas and then I would come home and I would uh, you know uh, have a time with my friends um, uh, on the west side and as a young impressionable kid I I could I could see the difference. But there were more similarities than differences. The 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 white parents loved their kids. The the black parents loved their kids. It was a lot of similarity, but Good. there were some some differences in culture, 
and and uh, I was able to um, to assimilate to both of them, which which kind of was like an advantage um, uh, for me, uh, and it wasn't such a culture shock uh, being in um, in all white now, environment. Okay. Uh, Doctor Wright, that leads me to somewhere in our episodes we're going to talk about the evolution uh, and the sea, some of the darker sides yes. uh, uh, and uh, unfortunate sides that have evolved from back then to what it is today. It was tough. Uh, and we'll talk about the entertainer issues, uh, some of their issues, uh, black entertainers. Yes. But uh, no, I mean, you, you've got a well-rounded... Well, well, from from yes. high, from high school, I I, um, I like I said, I had a lot of football scholarships, but then I used to go and watch the running Rebs play under Rolling Todd. See, the running Rebs were running before Jerry got here. <laughs> okay, you know? that's a good so, story. Yeah, yes. yeah, and so I used to go and watch them, and you know, Cliff Finley, uh, uh, he played on those teams. I think he was the only maybe one or two white guys on the team, but Cliff was, they called him Hoss because he would grab all the rebounds, man. <laughs> and he could score too. Yeah. He was a he was a he was a great player. He's a Rodman. Yeah, he was a great he was a great, he was a great he was a great player. Uh, but um from when I got recruited uh, by Roland Todd, I signed a letter of intent, but after um, before we started playing, Roland Todd left UNLV and became the head coach of the Portland Trail Blazers. Oh my God! You so you were thinking that's who were your coach? I was going to be coached by him, and so it was kind of too late after I signed the letter of intent. I could have, you know, I had visited Cornell for football, Cornell University. My goodness! Yeah, I Ithaca, visited, New York. Yeah, yes. Ithaca, New York. I was there. Matter of fact, when I was there, um, too cold. It, it was it was cold, but <laughs> you know they were having civil unrest while I was on my visit, and I. I kept looking at the students, and I said, no, nah, I don't want to come here. So I, I didn't go to Cornell, although I knew I wanted to learn hospitality. Hospitality uh, at Cornell and at UNLV are, are, are two of the best schools. Two to, premier institutions. When yes. It comes to, yes. And, and Dean, but <clears throat> I, all, I, I'm, I always say Las Vegas has the edge because of all of our resources, the largest hotels in the world, and a community of leaders that, just like my lecture series, they want to come out and raise up a, a bank of talent to take on this industry and take it to another level. It's passing the baton. Yeah, passing and, the baton. And moving, as you say, evolving upwards. You know, you mentioned uh, Ithaca Cornell. Uh, look at you're in the hotel school at uh, Cornell Ithaca, and you go out to look for the hotels uh, in the city, and you think you're going to see a 3,500 room hotel, another 3,000 room hotel, 150,000 rooms in this city. Cornell, yeah, I'm not going to. That's what. That's why you know. Yeah. Th just this is my prejudice and my rationalization of saying that UNLV is 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 it has the edge on Ithaca because of all of our resources, the, the hotels uh, and the individuals that will give up their time that built those hotels, that operated those hotels to come out and lecture to our Listen, students. That's the difference. You sitting here uh, and sitting in a, a head of a classroom, what did you start in this industry? You start at the bottom yes. and worked everything in there up to working in Caesar's Palace, tell me that. I I, I, I tease my students uh, because at the very beginning of my class, I, I give an introduction of myself. Right. And and I show a picture of me uh, playing basketball at uh, UNLV, and back in back in the days when we wore hot pants, you know. Oh yes, <laughs> we yes. We wore the short yeah. the short pants yeah. back in my day, and <laughs> and, the, and the Chuck Taylors. Yes. You know. And, and um, so when I talk to my students, I said, I have done literally almost every job you can think of from front of the house to back of the house. I, I've been a security guard. Look at my size. I, I've, I've been in surveillance at, your, at the property that mm -hmm. I was hired at Luxor. Uh, I've been a dealer. I've been a floorman. You name it, I've done. I've been a, um, uh, I was a house porter. 
Uh, and I said, I could have been a cocktail waitress because <laughs> you know I got the legs for it. Yes, and you so do. They, I bust they go them. crazy. <laughs> they go crazy, you know. Yes. But uh, it, it's one thing about being a hospitality professor and, and coming from Las Vegas and as well as you, it's, it's in our blood. It's a labor of love. We love it. Uh, I've, I've worked in the business. I love the business. I love. I, I tell all my students, if you don't love people, this is the wrong business to be in. Uh, absolutely. If you don't, and I'm talking about all kind of people, you know, from different walks of life, from different nationalities. You, you, you. The customer is the customer, and you treat them all the same, and that is with good customer relations. We're, we're an international city. Yes, we international are. International customers yes, are. are base, and you're absolutely correct. Respect is crucial, uh, and, and we provide that here, and we will in the future. The other thing we, we will be talking about, not today, uh, but will be the impact of the COVID on our industry, which is probably the industry that took the big – they all took hits, but this was – Incredibly. And and not only that macro change, which was a worldwide change, it affected uh, all of uh, all of the world. Yes. But the micro changes like October 1st, the shooting over at uh, the Mandalay Bay, how it kind of changed our the way that we uh, treat uh, uh, security and surveillance. You know, um, we're going to talk about that and go into detail about that. So there have been some micro and macro changes that I I would like to say our city and our city leaders, there there was some tough things to grapple with, but we got a hold of them, and and we we've done well. We've done well, and and now l- looking forward, I went to a a, uh, a game at the Legion uh, uh, Stadium. What what a place! What a beautiful place to. Mm-hmm. And, and I happened to see the first game that the Rebels played there. I was in a luxury box, and I said, oh, wow, this is something else. Yes. And, and um, the new uh, basketball coach as well as his, as his dad, Coach K- uh, Cougar, yes. Lon yes. Cougar, uh, they invited some of the former Rebels to come and, and uh, uh, be a part of that. And, and so I was there along with some other former Rebels. But what about that stadium? It's so beautiful. It's unreal, man. It's incredible. And uh, I haven't had the opportunity to get there. And I know that one of the the issues, the challenges, is the parking issue. And we're going to have some people coming on a future show that's going to discuss parking, not only around that concept, but the convention center and, and downtown as, as well. So. That, that, that parking is a challenge, but <clears throat> who, the, the, when they thought about having that, that uh, stadium right off the strip, it, after, after a game, fun. after a game, guess what? If they're winning, they're spinning. Yeah. If they're winning, they're spinning. It's like I, I have some friends that are in the industry, and they say it's like a mini New Year's, man. You know, it's like a mini New Year's. It's a real, uh, um, uh, uh, it's a lot of people that, that come here and they gamble. But but we in other episodes, we're going to talk about how everybody is coming to Vegas. No, you, you hit the nail on the head. Elysian Stadium is perfectly situated, and, and we will adapt and correct any things that aren't right. But its location, think of another stadium that you just said you could walk out and your team wins and you walk to one of our beautiful hotels. And celebrate. And literally walking distance uh, right. in the city. No, it, it, it was celebrate. amazing. And they have, uh, what I noticed at that, the game with the Rebels, they have shuttles going back. So it's pretty, it's, it's organized. Yes. The, 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 despite of the, the infrastructure, uh, some of the infrastructure, it, it's it will, very well organized. Our, our police department is there. Um, uh, they do an excellent job in, in bringing in and out the people. So it wasn't really that bad. It's just, uh, uh, it wasn't bad at all, to be honest with you. But it, it is, you know, when that, those games, when they're over, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you to drive 
anywhere <laughs> near that. And, uh, you know, but like you say, we're we're learning, uh, yes, and, and and they're adapting and changing and, and evolving themselves to to accommodate these. And the, and the Raiders and the Raiders have have become a big part of our community. They, oh, yes, uh, I think I saw something on the news where they they are donating helmets to our. Our high school students, very, they're doing a lot of very stuff. Very community in the community. oriented. Very yes. community yeah, oriented. Yeah. And, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just a joy having them here. And speak of uh, another sport, uh, the basketball, the Aces, the man. WNBA. I, I've gone to a couple of their games. Very exciting. Their coach, uh, I met him years ago when I did coach the Lam- – Coach Bill Lambeer. I met him years ago. Uh, and I tried to get down to talk to him uh, at one of their games. Um, he played in the Notre Dame versus UNLV alumni game I can't with with Adrian Dantley. Man, what a, he was a heck of a player. Yes, and and just you know, I, one day I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna go down and say, hey, remember that alumni game? I I. I know he's going to remember that the running Rebels beat him. <laughs> <laughs> He'll never forget that. But 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 they played well. They you know they only they they were supposed to bring ten players and only uh, seven showed up. So our coaches platoon the heck out of those guys. Ran, right? We ran them. Ran, ran, we ran them. And the they, running and, Rebels took right, them. Down. Right, and they 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 ran. They tried to run with us, but. Uh, we kind of uh, ran them out. I, I, I'm going to. I hope we use that friendship uh, to get him to sit in this room yes, with yes. one of his players. Oh yeah. Uh, when the season's over, we're hoping that they prevail. Uh, uh, Speaking of, of him, we, we'd love to get the Oakland Raiders here as well because they're a part of the. Oh the yes, name of yes. our our, our uh, podcast is Las Vegas Hospitality Evolution. They're a part of that evolution, and so are the Aces. And then our hockey team, man. Wow. Well, you got what the, a, what, the Golden how, Knights are incredible. The, yes. They are just absolutely unreal. A, uh, a, a, uh, a, a team that, that have done so much at, at such an early time. Uh, of, First of and be- second season and running for the Stanley Cup. Come on, man. And again, a community. Uh, love our community. They, yes. they do so much for the community. This is what I'm thinking. Oh, by the way, and you also have uh, the uh, the lights that are a soccer team, and I'm going to talk about soccer. One of our uh, issues, which uh, Europe Europe is football, yes. uh, but anyway, we're going to we'll cover those cover those bases. What I'm thinking is someday Lonnie is going to be an NBA, the National Basketball team will locate here. Well, you know, I, I have a friend, uh, Jackie Robinson. Who has some uh, some land and and uh, I I would love to see him and he's talked about it and I don't know if I'm at liberty to share with the audience. We'd love to have share. Jackie <laughs> on our show. We, we're going to work on get yeah, Jackie. Yes, getting Jackie on our show to to talk about his vision and possibly uh, uh, you know uh, having an NBA uh, and, and uh, arena. Part. On his property. Uh, on his property. Which sits between Sahara and where the old uh, River Yarra, El Rancho used to be. Yes. That is an b- absolute blank spot that is ready to build uh, another stadium. So, yes. You know, when you, you and I talk to our, our young, impressionable, eager students, and we start bringing up the El Rancho, and we <laughs> bring up the dunes, and we... And they look at us like, what? And then we tell them, well, the dunes was where yes, the well, Mandalay Bay. Yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, no, 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 no. The dunes is where Bellagio. Uh, Bellagio. Yes. Sorry. No, the, the, that, that's one of the, I think, the important things that we kind of both, especially you, having been here so long, bring to the classroom. The El Rancho. What is the El Rancho? Well, let me get into a little bit of history. You know, mm-hmm. uh, the, uh, the whatever was sitting there has changed hands, and that's how this evolution. This town occurs. has reinvented itself mm. with 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 guys like Sig Rogage, and you know all of these innovative, creative thinking uh, people. Here, here you have uh, Steve Wynn the and, and Elaine Wynn uh, having a uh, a volcano out in front of a hotel. 
and 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 they're not charging any tickets. Uh, people can watch it for free. But but I get it. That frontal marketing. That's it. Front. That's that frontal cool. marketing is what causes people to say, if they have this on the outside, what's inside? And that's the whole. That's the <laughs> and, hook. And they go in, you know, just like the pirate show at the tre- Treasure Island. You know, uh, uh, at the end of that pirate show, which which evolved, and using the word ev- uh, evolution, mm-hmm. evolved uh, when the MGM uh, bought it into the Vixens, you know, it was more of a sexy show for adults. Right. When, when, when that show would end, and the adventure continues, and they open up the door, and people just go they in. in. They're like uh, they're under a trance, man. Yeah. They just want to see more. No, it's entertainment. Yeah. As you say, the Bunch term of marketing. entertainment, we've combined it with uh, entertainment. And sports. Sports and... Uh, That's it. Well, the, the, the nuance that started off, Las Vegas was the gambling capital of the world. Then when we started proliferating... Uh, throughout the United States and especially the Bible Belt, we started calling it the gaming, gaming, gaming industry. And then from gaming, uh, we said entertainment. When we involved the 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 family with Circus Circus, uh, uh, having people from eight to eighty, that was a new uh, uh, new evolution because it, the, Vegas was a, uh, a an adult playground, and so now. Um, uh, the owner of Circus Circus, uh, uh, he uh, thought outside of the box, and he says, you know, they had done a, a, enough questionnaires of of uh, and with the convention authority, and said, um, you know, they would ask this question: How many times have you uh, come to Vegas? Oh, twice. Would you think about coming again? More than twice. Yeah, but what am I going to do with my kids? That was the catalyst of saying, you know something? He, We're going to have something for you kids. He had the, he circus, circus, man. Yeah, exactly. Now circus, that, circus. That was a Bill Bennett and Jay Sarno Bill, who built it, but it was Bill Bennett that took it to it the other Think level. about the innovators. You think about frontal marketing with with uh, uh, Mr. Wynn and, and Elaine Wynn. You, you think about uh, uh, adding... Uh, going from an adult-oriented playground to now, uh, you know, kids are are here in Vegas. They want to come to Vegas. You know, I, I'm going to be uh, talking in another episode of of uh, of how that uh, kind of played out uh, with the Treasure Island property when when uh, um, the winds uh, had a television program uh, that really was. Uh, um, was an introduction. It was like a back-to-school special where kids could see this program and they say, and this was innovative marketing, Mm -hmm. I want to go to uh, Treasure Island because... They, they they made a movie out of it, and we'll talk about that yes, a little later. Yes. No, we, got, we have so much to talk the, about. When we talk about hospitality, think of the components that's involved in that. Our McCarran Airport, which is now, I think, going to be uh, Harry Reid, which I hope that that happens. But you think about that. You think about the events that go on in the city. The Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority, their component. And another important very positive, in my opinion, of course, is the union involvement, our culinary union, what they've brought to the table and, and to the workers in our, in our fine hotels. There are so many things that hospitality is involved in, and we're going to be covering a lot of them. The private airline, the private airplanes, we have our Southwest, but you've also got those little jets that come in here that bring in a certain group of people. Uh, we'd love to talk about that a little bit. Very more affluent detailed. people. Uh, and uh, actually, that is even involving where very affluent, but but it's pricing now where it's even a little bit lower, still much more expensive than Southwest. And you, 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 you spoke about um, uh, our, our senator, which is really apropos to, to name the uh, the airport after Harry, uh, the senator, senator Reed. Harry Reid, who um, grew up in, 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 uh, in southern Nevada. Um, but this is very unique uh, of a city, and, and it shows 
how how young our city is when you have schools named after people that are still alive. Yeah. You know, you know, yeah. yeah. But but it's it's so apropos because th- they made this city. But but the reason why that chemistry happens happened is because this was the fastest growing city in America for many years. And the school district were the fastest. And you ran out of names. You know, how many, uh, uh, well, let's name something after Sig Rogich. Let's, let's name something after. Tony the, Alamo. Uh, yeah, uh, all of the yeah. people that have made this city great. And, and, and I get people from out of town, and they, and they look at our school. You say, well, didn't you introduce me to Sig Rogich? Yeah, he has a school named after him. Oh, well, all of these schools are named after people that are still alive. Well, we're the fastest growing city. We have you to have name to, them after somebody. You know, and there's something to be said about that. Their achievements justify Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And why not recognize it Absolutely. while they're here? Absolutely. Uh, uh, but how many cities can say that? Not, no, not, 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 not too many why, that I can think that's of. That's why this city is a phenomenon. It, 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 it just, it, it, it's outside the box. Matter of fact, they threw the box away. (laughs) This town threw the box away. And with all the innovators that we're going to have on this program to talk about that, uh, um, what they have contributed, uh, a lot of them, we got to coax them into it because a lot of of these uh, movers and shakers, they're they're not braggadocious. They just get the job done. And they're doers. They are doers, all the way doers. And can you imagine... A city that, you know, uh, is in the middle of a desert and all of a sudden it becomes a metropolitan city. No. Not all of a sudden, but it evolves into a metro. It had, how did that happen? Uh, how did that happen? We don't have the ocean front. We you don't have, have nothing. Well, we do have I mean, skiing up the, in Mount Charleston. Well, no, back in the was. day, though, in you, Lake Mead. you described it perfectly. Yes. Before Lake Mead, yes, this was a watering hole, a yes. stop off, a Pony Express or something. I don't know right. what that story right. is, but uh, think about it when you fly into Las Vegas today, oh, which wow. you see, uh, there's nothing like it that I can think of. Even Macau doesn't look like this when no. you come into this no. this beautiful uh, city. So, I, like I said, I this program, this podcast is going to be watched not only here in Las Vegas by the students and the movers and shakers that are here domestically around the country because gaming and internationally and that most important yes. not most but gaming uh, domestically is just about an half of the states in our in our country and this is where they're going to learn yes. this is where they're going to hear yes. it from yes. the people and and in in a in a uh, as we do in our classroom those that are undeclared majors we convince them that this is the industry to be in if you like people and you like and you don't mind serving people we don't stop with that word serving if you're not if you don't have a servant heart and you don't want to see people have a great time in your city and 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 the products and service that you present to them then this may i i I give this example uh, Dr. Peacock, Good. I give this example of uh, being in the manufacturing business and the hospitality business. And I say, let's talk about cars. And say the car goes down the the conveyor belt, the assembly line. Some, someone puts on the wheel. Someone puts on the hubcap. Someone puts on the steering. Sure. And the product goes out and those involved Never see the customer. That's exactly right. Never see the customer. In our business, the customer is in your face (laughs) 24-7. And so it's a whole different mindset. And I I always tell the kids, you know, know, if you don't want to serve people, then maybe you may want to think about the manufacturing business. No, you have to. (laughs) Yes, yes. And they all go, no, 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 no. no, no, no. no. I want to work with the people. Right. But a lot of them... And most of them do safe. And it's and it's been such fun, man. Yes, yes it, it it's a it's a challenge. It's a it challenge is. because you 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 uh, uh, you can uh, every now and then uh, run a run into uh, an irate customer for whatever reason, and and uh, we have to be thermostats. And you, <laughs> we have to control the temperature. We can't go up with the customer. So you just let them talk, let them vent. 
Don't take it personal. And then while they're talking and venting, you're thinking of a remedy to their problem. And when you when you resolve it, it's almost like you got a, a jackpot. I took care of this person and brought that temperature down. And, and that's that that's a key issue. But it is a tough business. Yes. No doubt. You think of that front desk clerk who sits there checking in one customer after another and looking at that line, knowing that it goes on and on and on. And invariably, you're going to get just what you said. The one customer, why is my room not ready? How can you do this to me? I want to see the boss. I want the... the but a professional does not... A trained professional does not take that personal. Yes. They, they know in retrospect that they've been on trips, and now this is their job. And, and as you said, it would be um, their, their professional duty to, to come up with a, a, a remedy, this, to take a frown into a smile. Yes, that, 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 that customer is yes. here for a holiday yes. and good times. And, you know, but, no, it's... Uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to, uh, 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 those of you that uh, have liked what you've heard in our introductions of each other, we're going to be the co-host. Uh, pr- please press like and, and, and join us uh, for every episode. We're, we're going to have uh, some, some guests here that, that y- you, you wonder how did this happen, and we're going to have some of the people that made it happen uh, right here, and we're going to talk about how our lecture series has has uh, um, uh, evolved into our podcast. We're going to share some of our lecture series of those individuals that gave of their time to come out and speak to our students. Uh, again, the Elaine Wynn, the Bill yes. Policies, our Governor uh, Bob Miller, former Governor, former Senator. Uh, and it goes on and on. Pat Christensen uh, from Las Vegas Events. Uh, Mr. Peter Bernhardt, the longest running serving uh, chairman of the powerful Gaming Control Board. He took out the time and coming. And, and what a lecture our kids learned and a lecture that we can share with our kids in the future. So if you like what you've heard here, uh, we're, the, we're the host. Uh, uh, my, my partner and, and, and my friend, uh, Dr. Thomas yes, Peacock, Dr. Thomas Peacock and myself, we look forward to you seeing every episode of Las Vegas Hospitality Evolution. And tell your friends, tell your friends that are in the business, that are students, to watch this. Not only watch this, you can also get in contact with us if we've missed something and you have a story to tell. Exactly. Please call. Uh, you'll see it on the screen. Get in, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, the, the baby boomers. And, and <laughs> not only baby boomers because things are evolving. Millennials. But yes. the, the millennials, any one of you, because, uh, you know, I, I, we, you know, you and I used to go to now this is gonna age us discotheques, oh, no. discotheques. You know, <laughs> now they have a bottle service. I don't think I would have enough money to go uh, there, no, man. No, 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 I, I, I couldn't do <laughs> but, it today. Yeah. yeah, but the young people, man, that they're, they're they're enjoying Las Vegas in a different way. Uh, it's still under fun, and Las Vegas reinvents itself for each generation. Yes, it does. Just like going from adult to family. Yes, and and uh, finding those. Um, the, you know the the attributes that that will draw the psychographics of of individuals that that may be from a different cu- uh, culture. We we study culture at the college and and at UNLV to make sure that that we are uh, at least be able to say hello and goodbye in in certain languages to ingratiate that guest. So this is a science. Hospitality is a science. And then this gentleman across from me make it an art form. Oh, this is <laughs> you too, my man. All right, so we look forward to, to uh, you joining us uh, for each one of our podcasts. You'll see information and uh, hit like and subscribe to Las Vegas Hospitality Evolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.